This is the respiratory emergency section of the CPEN exam review course. This section is part of the system focused emergencies. Um, and that section actually covers 56 questions on the exam, which is about 37%, um, and is broken up into a bazillion sections. So what we did is we decided to break that up into each of its specific systems. Um, so the respiratory system will be a small section of that larger. So many sections you'll see um, all part of that system focus, system focused emergencies. So the respiratory emergency specifically will cover these sections. Um, so you'll see uh, obstructive conditions, uh, infectious inflammatory trauma, uh, emergencies specifically related to the respiratory uh, uh, tract. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about respiratory compromise and then interventions related to that. So let's jump in. We'll start with a challenge question. So here's your first challenge question. A child is scheduled to undergo a sweat chloride test. The test is indicated for the detection of A, cystic fibrosis, B, acute tubular necrosis, C, acquired tracheal stenosis, D, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. What do you think? Think about that one and we'll come back to the answer when we teach that section. So let's start with obstructive conditions. So we'll start with uh, foreign bodies. So airway foreign bodies are the emergent uh, aspect of foreign bodies. Um, in the GI section, we'll talk about um, uh, swallowed foreign objects, um, but uh, uh, inhaled foreign objects or airway foreign objects are the ones that are more likely to be on the exam. Um, so with these, you'll find um, that uh, the child is uh, much more likely as they're exploring. So if you um, saw the developmental stages section, um, this is most likely that kid um, between 12 months and 24 months um, where they're exploring their environment, right? Makes sense. Uh, they're going to have the mobility and the lack of protective defensive mechanisms um, to uh, protect them from putting things into their gullet. Um, and then the funnel-shaped um, oropharynx uh, and their trachea, if things do get uh, inhaled, they're gonna get trapped. Um, so that's why it's much more likely uh, in this phase. Um, that peak then is um, gonna be right there. Anyone under three though is at risk, but the highest would be uh, in the uh, 12 months to 24 months. The one exception there on the screen there is in the upper left corner. Um, if you really zoom in there, you'll see that that's a swallowed pendant, just showing the difference. So if you really want to know that difference, that's called the radiograph sign. Um, and you would see that on a plain film, if you happen to see it, if you had time to take a plain film, um, your, um, your chest or soft tissue neck um, would show that the object would turn um, its broad side um, if it's in the esophagus and it would turn um, its narrow side if it's in the trachea. Um, and that is based on the um, tracheal ring um, giving it uh, its spin. But the flattened area um, of the esophagus would allow it to turn uh, sideways. So it's just one of the little tricks you would see on um, an imaging exam. I don't know if that would ever be a question, but um, that is something that you would see in a radiograph. Uh, but most of the time, uh, you're not gonna wait for an X-ray to uh, try to uh, help this child. Going down through it, if it's a complete airway obstruction, you're gonna see that the uh, no airway sounds, uh, no movement, you're going to immediately go into intervention. Got it, easy, move past it. But if this is an obstruction above the cords, your difference here in uh, the patient's symptoms will be that uh, the patient's going to make um, no airway sounds. They can't um, uh, alter their vocal cords because that obstruction is above them and they're not gonna be able to vibrate those cords. So they won't be able to make any words. Even if it was weak, they wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but um, you might hear um, inspiratory strider because of that narrowing, um, and you might hear expiratory wheeze. Um, so that's always gonna be the point when you have narrowing or decreased um, flow. Um, strider uh, in and wheeze out is um, the most common difference you would, uh, would note. Um, so the rest of it is fairly unchanged. Again, 
let them assume a position of comfort and uh, maximize the air they are getting in. So oxygen, um, and then prepare for it to be removed. Now, if it's below the cords, everything is the same on a complete, but on partial, um, they're gonna be able to wake, make weak airway noises uh, because they can move that air across their cords and uh, make weak sounds. They might be able to make some uh, you know, small amount of communication. Who really cares in real in real time, right? Really, we're still going to maximize. We're going to try to calm them um, and help to uh, get them to the best outcome. But a test question could be written based on the difference. So that's the only reason I'm mentioning that. In in the the real you know importance of the issue, it's not important. So, um, but mentioning that because I've seen test questions written uh, about that difference. Now, if it's down in the bronchus, and so it's uh, in the main stem or down in the lung field itself, um, there would be a difference. Um, and so with that one, um, you're going to see a unilateral loss of breath sounds. Now, that could be partially complete. It doesn't matter. But you're still going to have air coming up the other side. So with that one, uh, you're going to see um, uh, they'll be able to breathe on one side. So you'll have airway uh, sounds on one side and you'll have a loss or diminished sounds on the other. Could be with wheezing, right? Um, but it goes back to our first thing we said. If you hear any airway sounds, you support the patient. So you'll, you'll see the treatment on both sides is the same. Um, oxygen and prepare to remove it. So it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of this section. Um, it goes back to BLS. So don't overthink it.